Okay, youth, your prayers have been answered and you are dismissed. Look, there's Pastor Chris over there waving you out. And God bless you as you go out, youth. Once again, so good to see everybody. Uh, thank you for being here with us this morning. Thank you for being with us at home. I know uh, with daylight savings, maybe more of you are staying home. That's probably, I mean, I think our online numbers this morning literally are breaking the internet. They had, they're having to add internet maybe just to keep up with, I don't know how you add internet, but I think they're doing it even as we speak. More servers somewhere just to keep up with the huge online demand this morning. So anyway, good to see everybody. I'm excited. We're in the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 2. We're going to look this morning at verses 12 through 17, and I truly believe that the Lord has some things he wants to speak to us and share with us this morning. Um, so let's pray. Oh, I did want to say this before we pray. Um, I know that Susie mentioned Easter, and of course, it's, uh, it's upon us. It's that very first Sunday in uh, April, and so it'll be here before we know it. Um, it is a great time to invite people out now that we can be out, or to invite them to tune in and join us on the live stream. Um, be on the lookout for um, some different social media stuff that we're going to be putting out on the different platforms that you can share with your friends, and as well, uh, there'll be a special like an email invite that you'll get in your inbox, and the idea is that it's sort of tailor-made for you to go ahead and forward out to those uh, on your email lists that you might want to invite to uh, to be with us. So um, be on the lookout for that just in the next couple weeks as we get closer and closer to, uh, to a great day of celebration. So now let's pray and just ask the Lord to bless us uh, as we look at the word this morning. Father, we do thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, that we just have this privilege, Lord, of being able to uh, openly study it, Lord, and to just freely assemble together and, uh, and offer up our praise and our worship to you, Lord, and to be taught by you, Lord. We pray uh, that you would speak to us this morning, Lord, through your word. We pray uh, as we pray each and every time we open it, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to your church. Lord, give us ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to each of us uh, personally, we pray. And so we ask your blessing, Lord, on this time, uh, and we ask it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. 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 So Revelation chapter 2, here Jesus is speaking to his church, right, in these seven letters to the seven churches there in Asia Minor. And we've talked about the fact that these are so very rich in application for us. Um, first of all, locally, remember, these are real letters to real churches that we're dealing with real issues in those churches. And not only are these letters applicable to those seven churches specifically, or to those specific churches kind of locally, but they also apply to the whole church, right? We said ecclesiastically or corporately might be uh, just as good a word, in that the issues that these seven churches were facing are the same issues that most all churches throughout history have faced or will face at some time in their uh, time. So, um, so they apply corporately for, so to all of us. They also, we saw in a, in a very fascinating and almost a mysterious way, we talked about the fact that the order of these seven churches amazingly kind of parallels the order of various eras within church history. And each of them sort of representative then, a period of church history, so they apply then to us historically as well. And most importantly, in addition to locally and corporately and historically, most importantly, of course, they each apply to us as believers personally. Because, of course, the Christian church collectively is simply made up of individual Christians um, individually. And what these letters do for us is they really reveal to us the heart of Jesus for each one of us as his children, right? They give us such a clear revelation, if you will, of the things that are important to Jesus in his church and to Jesus for his church. First, we saw from that church at Ephesus, 
that revelation of just how important first love is to Jesus from his church. And then we looked last week at Smyrna, that revelation of the importance of faithfulness to him, faithfulness even to the point of death. And so as we look at these letters, um, you know, they really search us, but they search us in a good way, don't they? They challenge us individually. They kind of help us to hold up our relationships personally with the different things that we know that Jesus wants of us and the things that Jesus wants for us. And really this beautiful picture of the relationship that he desires to have with us. And this morning, as we kind of continue, we're going to see Jesus is going to turn his attention to the next church of the seven churches, so our third church of seven, and it's going to present, I think, an equally searching question for each one of us to really consider as we look at lessons from the church at Pergamos. And it begins, as we've seen all of them begin, in verse 12, with a reminder from Jesus. So verse 12 of Revelation chapter 2, Jesus says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now, the city of Pergamos was located about 20 miles inland from the city of Smyrna, and it was the political capital of that Roman province of Asia Minor, a very influential city, a very prominent city, a very wealthy city, but not so much for trade and commerce since it wasn't a seaport city. But it was a noted, again, a, a sort of a, a power center politically, but it was also very much a center for culture. It was a center for education. It was a, a university city. And it had one of the great libraries of the ancient world with more than 200,000 volumes. Now that number doesn't sound like a lot to us today, but it's astonishing, it's really staggering when you consider that every single one of those 200,000 volumes had to be hand copied. You know, so this was an amazing thing. It was a center for learning. It was a center for knowledge, if you will. Also like Ephesus and Smyrna, it was a, a wealthy city, but it was also a very wicked city. Right, scores of, of, of people in those pagan cults worshiping the Greek and the Roman gods, right? Dionysus and Zeus and Athena and Aesculapius, right? In fact, the temple of Zeus that was located here very high atop a hill in Pergamos, it was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Pergamos had three different temples each dedicated to the worship of the Roman emperor, much like we saw that Smyrna did. So we may have thought that nothing could have topped Smyrna in terms of idolatry and pagan temples, and yet Pergamos did. And because it was such a center for pagan worship, it brought with it all of those things that pagan worship always brought with it, and that was that it filled the city with sexual immorality. Because all of these temples, for the most part, had temple priestesses, which were essentially simply religious prostitutes. And so part of the worship is that everyone would come and worship and engage in this wild sexual immorality as a part of their worship. So you have a constant stream of pagan worshipers flocking to Pergamos to participate in these things. As well, in Pergamos you have this constant stream of the sick and the infirmed because Pergamos was also a center for medicine in the ancient world. It was practiced there in the great temple to the pagan god of Asclepius, right? He's the Greek god of physicians and healing. And significantly, the emblem of Asclepius was a serpent because according to Greek mytholo mythology, that was a form that he would take from time to time. Now, admittedly, it's kind of bad imagery, isn't it, from kind of biblically speaking. But so often when you see statues or paintings of Asclepius, 
he's standing there, as he is in that picture, with a staff, right? And there's a, a serpent making its way up the staff, which, of course, is the symbol, even to this day, of modern medicine, right? Both of the American Medical Association, right? Even the World Health Organization. Now, I'm just going to simply leave it there and let you make your own commentary and draw your own conclusions, and yet it's very interesting at least. So the next time you're kind of kept waiting there in the exam room by the doctor and you have nothing to read, go ahead and read the diplomas on the wall and very likely you will see this um, sort of emblem or the symbol of the serpent to Asclepius. These priests of Asclepius, they were considered the doctors of the day. Now their methods were a bit unorthodox certainly at least what we would consider to be orthodox. Just a fun fact, one of the things that they used to do is that they would take all these people who came to Pergamos that were suffering from all these different kinds of diseases, and they would have those people sleep on the floor in the darkness there in the temple to Asclepius. And then during the night, the temple priests would release all of these harmless snakes to slither around all over the floor and all over you right, as they would sort of glide and they would slither all over your body the touch of one of those snakes was considered to be the touch of Asclepius and somehow have healing properties of some sort it was all very scientific I'm sure. But that's the kind of treatment that they had in those days. And I, I don't know about you, but to me, this sounds like a clear-cut case of where the cure is worse than the disease, right? And yet, this was indicative of kind of the prevailing thought and the kind of atmosphere that was present there in Pergamos. The atmosphere of this city was so steeped in idolatry and mythology and immorality and superstition, it was absolutely adverse to any effective Christian life, any testimony for Jesus. And so we shouldn't be surprised that as Jesus writes to this church, again, the way he introduces himself as he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Again, he pulls this right from John's description of him from the vision we first saw in chapter 1. And again, to each church, he's reminding these churches of something specific about himself that they were either in danger of forgetting or maybe something which they knew, but they needed to be reminded of because it would be an encouragement for them in the midst of whatever their specific situation was. And can we just say that it seems from Jesus' reminder here like he has some deep concerns about this church. Remember to Ephesus, he said he was he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And then to Smyrna, he said he was the first and the last, right? He who is dead and came to life. But here in Pergamos, he reminds them that he has a sharp two-edged sword, right? The very same sword we saw pictured in chapter 1 where it said that out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. So, of course, it's the very word of God. And we see that the, the word he uses here for sword is the same one he used there for sword. We talked about the fact that it's a different sword than is used for the word of God in Hebrews chapter 4, when it talks about the, the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So that sword, remember, talks about kind of a short sword that was used for close combat. But the sword that he uses here that's that sword that could be up to five feet long, right? The kind of sword that would take two hands if some massive Roman soldier would just take this kind of a thing and as he began to swing it around in battle, it would just create carnage, right? Through that sword, he would bring awesome destruction 
upon his enemies there on the battlefield. And so this sword, it speaks about, it symbolizes the judging power of the word of God. And we're going to see that it's especially fitting here for this church in ancient Pergamos. Here they are in the midst of this intense wickedness and superstition and idolatry. And yet as we look next to the next verse, even in the midst of, even in spite of all of this, we see that Jesus begins with his approval of them. In verse 13, he says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. So Jesus readily recognizes the great difficulty of their difficult situation. He says essentially, I know what you're up against. I know what you're dealing with because I know where you live. And he grants them that they lived where Satan has his throne. Now, how would you like that to be on the travel website for Mountain View? Hey, come to Mountain View, you know, where Satan has his throne. Right? That is quite a title. But what it tells us is that as wicked as all of these ancient pagan cities were, right, wicked in ways that we can hardly imagine, but Pergamos, in the estimation of Jesus, Pergamos was somehow the ultimate stronghold of satanic and Jesus says, I know that you happen to live in this city, in the ancient world, from where the devil rules his demonic realm, like he rules from nowhere else. You know, the Bible teaches that the demonic realm is arranged kind of like a, in a military kind of an arrangement. Satan can't be everywhere at once, but he has a large number of angels that fell with him. Of course, and now we call them demons. And he instructs them and he commands them and they do his bidding. And so it gives the appearance of him being everywhere all over the place, but it's really just this kind of a kingdom in the spiritual realm, realm that he's orchestrating from one place. And at this time of the writing of the letter, Pergamos was that place, right? With those huge throne-like altars to the worship of the Roman emperor and the Greek gods and many of the mystery cults that had come from Babylon had also set up their headquarters in Pergamos. All of it making it just a capital of sensuous worship of these pagan deities. I don't know, but there may be times when you've gone into certain places around the world or around the country or even here around the Bay Area, and you just walk into those certain cities and you just sense, whoa, okay, this is a stronghold that I am walking into here. It's a, this is a demonic stronghold because there's just a stirring in your spirit that alerts you to that. And what you find, as you learn a little bit more about that city, is that that city that you've just entered into is probably steeped in idolatry and sexual immorality and depravity and often drug addiction. And so very often, you'll find that there's an educational institution that is very, very hostile toward the things of the Lord, just like you find here in Pergamon. Pergamos was not an easy place to be a Christian. And so Jesus is saying, I know that there are easier places for you to walk with me. I'm not unsympathetic to what you face every day in trying to live for me in that kind of an environment. And so he commends them for all of that. Because here they are in the middle of this demonic stronghold like nothing else. And he says, despite all of that, Look what he says, that you hold fast to my name and you did not deny my faith. So despite the impression of the environment, despite the wickedness of the environment, they held fast to Jesus' name. 
They held fast to who he is and to what he is. Even in this excessively wicked environment, they didn't budge from the fact that he is God the Son, that he is the Son of God, that he is the promised Messiah. They didn't hide the fact that they knew him. They didn't deny the fact that they followed him. They didn't deny their relationship with him. And they also, he says, they did not deny his faith. Now, that reference there to his faith would be what he taught. So they didn't deny what Jesus taught about eternity, about salvation. They didn't deny what he taught about how to live all of these different things. They were faithful to the words of Jesus. Right? They were faithful to the word of God and to who he was, even in this environment. And they continued to be that. Jesus here, he mentions Antipas. They continued to be that even in this life-threatening environment. Even in this environment where you could lose your life for standing true to those things. So these people are paying quite a price to be faithful to the Lord. Antipas is one of these great, really anonymous heroes of the Bible. Church history books tell us nothing about him except what we read right here. And yet what I love is we notice that Jesus does see. Jesus does take notice. Jesus makes note of Antipas. Antipas would not compromise who Jesus is. He wouldn't compromise what he taught. The name Antipas means against all and it's so fitting because you know though antipas lived where satan's throne was he stood against all the attacks he stood against all the evil he stood against everything that was all around him and i know that for so many of us especially living here where we do we can feel a bit like antipas at different times And yet when we do, we need to remember and we need to know that Jesus knows, doesn't he? He knows and he sees and just like Antipas, he counts us faithful. Now, like Antipas, for the most part, the Christians at Pergamos had been true to God under this severe environment of testing. They were faithful to his word in the face of death, even in that place where Satan dwells. And Jesus says, I know all that you're facing, and it is good what you are doing. And yet, as we continue on, we're going to see that there were some who had compromised that faithful testimony in other ways. In the next two verses, we're going to see Jesus' accusation against them. Look at verse 14. He said, but I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which thing I hate. Now, before we talk about what those are, I think it's important to note, because it applies to our own lives, that although the Christians in Pergamos had just been rightly praised for the way they held fast to the name of Jesus and the way that they had kept his faith in such a super difficult environment, notice at the same time, the difficulty of their environment did not excuse the few things that Jesus had against them. It didn't give them a pass, right? Jesus loved these people way too much to simply let them stay in their sin. Now, the name Pergamos comes from a Greek prefix, per, which means to be in opposition of. It's where we get like persuade or pervert, right? The word gamos means to be married. It's where we get monogamy or bigamy. So essentially, pergamos means 
objectionable marriage. And this church was starting to be married to some doctrines and some practices that were terribly wrong. There were two very serious doctrinal problems that were starting to permeate this church at Pergamos. They had been guilty of severe compromise by some who were holding to the teaching of Balaam and some who were holding to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, the doctrine of Balaam, you remember the story, right? The Old Testament book of Numbers. We've just been reading through it right in this point. Numbers chapters 22 through 25, Balaam, right? He was this non-Israelite, this Gentile, sort of a prophet, seer, soothsayer kind of a character. He's hired by Balak, who's the king of the Moabites, who sees this approaching horde of Israelites, and they're camped there kind of ominously on the plains of Moab, and they're threatening to take his kingdom on their way to the promised land. Remember, they've just been defeating enemy after enemy, one at a time. And you remember that Balak contracts Balaam, right? So the king contracts this prophet to curse the Israelites so that they would go away. But then remember, there's some strange visions, and there's an angel that shows up, and there's this talking donkey, and Balaam realizes that the Lord won't allow him to curse Israel. So much so that four different times, remember, he opens his mouth there with Balak to try to curse them, but the Lord fills his mouth, and all that comes out are these beautiful blessings. And so Balak is understandably incensed, and when Balaam realizes that he is about not to get paid, the prophet for hire kind of pulls the king aside and he says, look, he tells him the only way that Israel could be cursed and destroyed. He says, you will never be able to defeat these people because their God is simply too powerful. The only way to defeat them would be to get them to defeat themselves. And he lets him in on a little secret. He says their God is a holy God, a jealous God, an exclusive God. The only way to defeat them is to, would be to have your beautiful Moabite women go in, seduce the men of Israel, and then bring out all of their idols of the Moabite gods, and then compel these men in the heat of the moment, if you will, to join in and to worship these gods, right? They needed to convince these believing Israelite men to make unholy alliances with these Midianite women, and then their God would be forced to respond with righteous anger. And of course, we know the rest of the story. Balak did exactly that. And in Numbers chapter 25 at Baal Peor, he was successful. And remember, 24,000 men of the children of Israel died in one night as a result of a plague that was sent by the Lord to judge them for that sin. It's a fascinating account. It's, it's well worth the read. It's so rich, I think, in scores of different applications. But for here for us this morning, it drives home the point, not only as a church corporately, but for each and every one of us as individual believers, that we can never be defeated by any opposition that comes from the outside. We can only be defeated by what comes from within. When we allow things into our midst, or when we allow things into our lives that have to be judged by the Lord, not even the devil himself, right? Nothing from the outside, but only what I allow to come into my heart, and then I force God to judge me. So here's Balaam giving the appearance somehow that he's serving God, and yet he leads the children of Israel right into awful sin. He sets a trap for them of sin through this compromise and the creating of these unholy alliances with the world and ultimately bringing great judgment. That's what the doctrine of Balaam is at its core. It's compromise. It's making ourselves unequally yoked together, connected with the unbelieving world. And that's what these false teachers were doing here in Pergamos. 
Balaam was kind of a prototype, right? He's the poster boy of all corrupt teachers, right? So the, the doctrine of Balaam in application, it include, includes this kind of a whole concept that the church can somehow be married to the world and yet still be serving God. The, the Christians at Pergamos were just like those Christians in Corinth Remember, we just talked about them. Paul wrote to them in 1 Corinthians 5, that man who was sleeping with his stepmother, and all of the church was too tolerant. They were too accepting of these false doctrines and this immoral living, and they thought somehow they had this heightened sense of spirituality, and yet Jesus rebukes them. Right? And we see that what Satan here, he had tried through persecution but many were holding fast, just like Antipas. So then now he switches to another tactic, what he couldn't accomplish through persecution, now he tries to do using deception, right? First he tried violence, but now he tries alliance. And in fact, the church here at Pergamos locally is representative for us historically what we see later in the establishment, the development of the church-state alliance under Constantine in AD 316. It was the beginning of the state church or the church that was joined to Rome. Now, if you're familiar at all with him, you know that Constantine was said to have converted to Christianity and then immediately, subsequently, he adopted Christianity as the official state-sanctioned religion for the whole of the Roman Empire. And suddenly, overnight, 200 years of relentless Roman persecution seen all throughout the second and third centuries suddenly disappeared overnight. The Christians went from being a persecuted minority to now being the sanctioned religion of the state and supported and endorsed financially by the state. Now we think, well, that's great, except when we consider that Rome had been financially supporting all of these other pagan religious systems, and when all of those pagan priests and priestesses and teachers and all these people that had been on the Roman payroll from all of these other religions, when they realized that the money was now being dumped into Christianity, they then left what it was that they were really about, followed the money, joined themselves to Christianity, but of course they weren't pure in loving the Lord. They didn't even know the Lord. They weren't pure in the doctrine of the Lord. Any of these things, it was simply about the money and about the support, right? They brought, what happened is that when they did that, they brought all of their paganism with them into the faith. They brought all of their compromising, all of their idolatry right with them into the church. And so much of it was just so very, very wicked. And so we see that that would be the history of the church starting later in about the fourth century. But even here, just at the end of the first century, we see that that kind of seedbed for all of these evils had already begun to creep into the church. This introduction of compromise through idolatry, right? Worldly pagans were practicing these things and the church was okay with it. That's the doctrine of Balaam. And you couple that then with the introduction of this kind of a professional priesthood. Again, that's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus points out here that some in the church were also guilty of. We looked at it a little bit when we looked at the church of Ephesus, but remember that title Nicolaitans has the idea of a kind of a proud authority or a a hierarchical separ separation. The, the name Nicolaos literally means to conquer the people. And this is the first time in the early church that we start to see the church divided into priests and the people. And it's a division that Jesus never intended to have for his church, where you have one group of people in the body of Christ sort of conquering or ruling over 
another, right? The establishment of that kind of a spiritual hierarchy, that was never God's model for the church. Remember that pastor or minister, those words literally mean servant or slave. They do not mean most holy, reverend, exalted, high one. Just ask my wife, she will testify to that. We are all servants. We have different callings and we have different giftings. We have different roles within the body of Christ, but we're all equal within the body of Christ. Nobody is better than anybody else. We only have one, don't we, who's great. We only have one who we're to turn our attention to. We're not to be kissing anybody's rings. And in Ephesus, what we saw is that Jesus praised them because they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans just like he did. But unfortunately, what the Ephesian church had refused, some here in the church of Pergamos had fully embraced. Not all, but some. And it was the beginning, historically, which we'll see when we visit Thyatira next week. Many people see this as the beginning of Roman Catholicism, right? A religious system that has a clergy over the laity, where the church has introduced itself into a place in your life that only belongs to Jesus Christ. That, at its heart, is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And this doctrine, along with this doctrine of Balaam, it had crept into the church, and now it was threatening to destroy the church from the inside out. And so Jesus has these words of correction for them, these words of admonition to them. Look in verse 16. He says very clearly, repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So this church needed to repent of what it was that they were stuck in the middle of. They needed to recognize what was going on in the church, recognize that it was wrong, and they needed to take action. Remember, repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of, of action. We talk about it in terms of the unsaved, but it's a word Jesus uses here to us, to the church. It's not enough to look at this and say, wow, this is wrong, or hey, it looks like this is headed in the, in the wrong direction. Jesus said, you need to recognize that, but now you need to change everything about these two doctrines. These two doctrines that are becoming so fully entrenched within the church. He says, you need to stop the influence of these people over the church. And then he tells them that if they don't do that, if they fail to judge this bad situation, that he promises very clearly what? Well, then he's just going to go ahead and judge it himself. And he promises that it would come quickly, right? Soon. And it's that word again which means more so suddenly. When he does judge it, it's going to happen suddenly. And he'd introduced himself to them as he who has the sharp two-edged sword, and here he promises that he's going to judge them and contend with them using that same sword of the word of God, sharply judging all compromise and sin. Right? Jesus is going to confront this church with his word, and we might say they are going to feel the sharp edges of that sword. Here the the prophet Balaam had told Balak how to draw Israel away from their sense of holiness, and that's exactly what he did. He got them to compromise the word of God. And we know how this goes, right? We hear it all the time. Oh, the word of God, you know, it's a wonderful book, so very insightful. You know, everyone ought to know it, maybe have an appreciation for it. It's got such wonderful truths and it's got such beautiful poetic language and imagery, but you don't really need to take it literally. Right? You don't really need to take it that seriously, especially not in the world we live in, not in this 
sort of modern age. And you realize, don't you, that everyone thinks they're living in a modern age whenever they live, right? Because it's the most modern age that they know. But people say, you know, just as long as you believe these things in your heart, right, as long as you know these right doctrines in your head, it doesn't really matter how that works out in your life. See, that's the doctrine of Balaam. And though we see this explosive outgrowth of this error, we're going to see it in the fourth century, but of course we still see it increasingly today. We have entire denominations within Christianity. We have entire movements within Christianity who are increasingly abandoning that fundamental belief in a literal interpretation of the scriptures. And what they're turning to is a more blended, a more enlightened understanding, right, in our modern era. But it's an understanding that's less confrontational. It's an understanding that's way more in keeping with the values of the current culture. I just was reading this week um, one previously conservative megachurch in the Bible Belt, no less, and it was one of the first churches to simply accept an alternate view of marriage just back in 2015, and now we could describe them, they self-describe themselves as part of the progressive Christianity movement, right? Based on a declaration and a definition Right in their own words, here's a quote. As progressive Christians, we're open to the tensions and inconsistencies in the Bible. We know that it can't live up to impossible modern standards. We strive to more clearly articulate what scripture is and isn't. The Bible isn't the word of God, self-interpreting, a science book, an answer rule book, inerrant or infallible. The Bible is a product of community, a library of texts, multivocal, a human response to God, living and dynamic. Okay, it sounds like something that you would hear, I won't say it, on daytime talk, right? It, it approaches, you know, it assumes a human-centered approach to our faith instead of a God-centered Christ focused faith. It looks more like the world, and it's certainly more palatable to the world than it does look like the faith of Jesus that he, you know, commended this church for standing for. Clearly, progressive Christianity compromising what God said in his world for the sake of an unholy alliance with the world. But Jesus is so clear the word of God is what is to be the standard for what we believe and what we do and how we think and how we live. The Bible is the standard for doctrine and practice, not only in the church, but in our own individual lives. So important that when anything rises up within our lives that, meet, that doesn't match the standard of God's word, we have to deal with it ruthlessly in the same way that huge sword would be wielded in battle. That sharp sword of God's word has to be brought to bear against it until all of those lies of man and the traditions of man and the ideas of man and the wisdom of man, until anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God just lies defeated in a heap by the word of God. That's the only thing that will keep the church holy and separated from the world. It's the only thing that will keep us different than the world. And so often what we see is that the church makes the mistake, and I will grant you it's done sincerely sometimes. Sometimes it's even done out of a pure motive, but the church will try to be more like the world to attract the world. We'll try to de-emphasize holiness in order to make church more attractive or to make it more accessible right, to whoever it is we're trying to attract. It's like we're trying to communicate to the world that we're really no different than you are. We just happen to go to church. But that's just fundamentally not true. We are different. 
We are different because we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, right? We are saved. We have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead now living inside of us. We are not just a slightly better version of what we were, but we are a completely new thing, amen? As Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And it's such a mistake to think that we're gonna reach the world by becoming like it, because they know that we should be something different. They know that. And the truth is that they are looking for something different because they know that what they have and they know that what they feel is lacking. They don't know what is lacking, but they know that something is lacking. Something is desperately lacking and desperately empty. And they may not realize it, but what they're craving is holiness. What they're craving is purity. What they're craving is something that is not of this world. What, what unbelievers are looking for is not something that pretty much looks like the world with a little bit of Christian angel dust sprinkled on it. We're going to reach the world by living a different kind of life and then just trusting that the Holy Spirit is going to do in others what he first did in us, that he'll give them that hunger to know the truth and that he'll then lead them to the truth and that when they hear the truth, he'll quicken their hearts and they will give their lives to him. So we need to trust God to be faithful, to be that for them, to do that for them and that what we can do is we can be for them what others were for us so that they can see that there is a hope that they can really have that different kind of life. They can see in us the reality that Jesus can really make people into new creations and that he can really and will really do it using the pure, unadulterated, uncompromised word of God that is simply lived out by those who believe in him in that same uncompromising and unadulterated way. And then in verse 17, he says, he who has an ear, right, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He says, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So to the one right, who can overcome this spirit of accommodation to false teaching and, and the spirit of accommodation to false living, these unholy marriages with the world, right? To the believer in Pergamos or anywhere else, that person who is uncompromising concerning the word of God, Jesus says, I know you are going to pay a price for that. And so now he tells us how he's going to reward and bless those people for their faithfulness, he says, I'm going to give them some of the hidden manna to eat. So the hidden manna refers to this pot of manna. Remember that miraculous bread from heaven that was kept there in the Ark of the Covenant all the way back from the times of the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. And the manna in the Old Testament, remember, was God's supernatural way of supplying bread and meeting the physical needs of the children of Israel during their 40-year pilgrimage. And then we remember Jesus shows up in John chapter 6. He comes along and he declares himself to be that bread. John 6, he says, I am the bread of life, and he who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. He says, what the manna of the Old Testament was to you physically, I am now to you spiritually. So very simply, the hidden manna is God's perfect provision, Jesus Christ. Right, the true bread from heaven, that unseen source of a believer's nourishment and strength. 
And instead of, of feasting on those things sacrificed to idols that we read about in verse 14, right? Instead of feasting on those things of the world, we are to feast on Jesus, right? Taking him in to ourselves and nourishing ourselves. And when you think about it, because Jesus has been invited into our hearts, that's how we first became Christians. So become, because he's now inside of us, he really is now this hidden manna for us. And as we stay faithful to him, we are going to experience a relationship with him on a level that only the obedient do. And yes, it is hard and, and all of that, but those who do will access an intimacy with God that makes it all worth it. Because Jesus is talking about here about the blessing and the kind of intimacy and the kind of a relationship with him that comes only through our uncompromised obedience to his word. So that manna speaks of relationship. But then we're also promised, what, this white stone. And on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it, which speaks, I believe, of revelation, of a new understanding of the Lord. Now, in ancient times, the use of a white stone had all kinds of different applications that has led to all kinds of different understandings of what Jesus is saying here. All of them are beautiful. A white stone was often used as a, a ticket that you would be sent to get into a banquet. A white stone was sometimes given in those days as a sign of friendship. A white stone sometimes was evidence that you had been counted in some way. Or maybe most significantly, a white stone was a sign of being acquitted of your guilt in a court of law. If you were on trial in a courtroom, after the hearing, they would pass a bag through the jury, and if they thought you were guilty, they would put in a black stone. If they thought you were innocent and wanted to acquit you, they would put a white stone in. And so you would be either condemned or acquitted based on the count of those stones. And so in that sense, what Jesus is saying here is that if you repent of these kinds of things, if you stay away from all of this kind of compromise and stuff, then you will make yourself innocent of all of these charges I have against this church, and you'll be given a white stone. You'll be acquitted of all wrongdoing in the eyes of the Lord as it relates to these things that are happening here in this church. And the person who receives that stone from Jesus will discover that there's a name written on it that only those who have received the stone will know. And I am inclined to believe that this name is nothing less than the name of God. The name of the Lord found there on that stone. In other words, to the person that chooses to remain faithful to God over a life of compromise, they will receive a revelation about God and his nature and about the deep things of him. We learn something about his nature and his person in a way that the compromising believer simply do not. So the promises here are number one toward relationship, number two toward revelation. That's what comes to the obedient Christian. In, in John chapter 14, in verse 21, Jesus makes this wonderful promise to us. It's just after he has declared in verse 6 that I am the way and the truth and the life and that no one comes to the Father except through me. And then in verse 9 he promises that he who has seen me has seen the Father. And then in verse 21 he makes this declaration. He says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him. So that's relationship. Right? But then he closes out the verse 
And he says that he will also, what does it say? That he will manifest myself to him. That's revelation. A fresh and an intimate revelation that only comes as a result of it, and it's linked to our obedience to his word. It's the same promise that Jesus gives here to the church at Pergamos, and it's the same promise that he makes today to us. If they would listen to what he's saying, do what he is saying to do, judging those areas of compromise, hold them up to the standard of the word of God. Now, as we quickly close this morning, This passage does search us, doesn't it? It searches us in a good way because it forces us to ask the questions, what have we let creep into our lives? What areas of little compromise? You know, what are those things that we might watch now that maybe we wouldn't have watched before? What are those things that we do now that maybe we wouldn't have done before? Or those places that we might go now that we wouldn't have gone before? Or maybe there are things that we're questioning now in the Word of God that we may not have questioned before. That's compromise starting to creep into our lives. That's Pergamos. And we need to repent of those things Hold them up to the standard of the word of God, not to the standard of the world, right? And as we do that, and as we overcome, what? Hidden manna and a white stone, right? Relationship and revelation. Given to us in ways like we have never experienced them before. That's the promise that's given to us here by Jesus. Amen? So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that you have provided, Lord, such a clear standard for what it is that you would have from us, Lord. We do thank you that as though there are those areas in our lives, Lord, where the Spirit brings to mind, Lord, that we might be compromising, Lord. We're allowing worldly things or worldly thinking, Lord, to come in, Uh, to creep in, Lord. We thank you that we have your word that we can use as the standard. Um, Lord, help us to lay our lives out before you and to set them up against the standard of your word. Speak to us today, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name.